Jesus, hello. We are here again. We're here again for your word. We're here again for your presence. We're here again, Lord, to have our our chiropractic done. We ask, Lord, that you would touch our hearts and our minds. We ask, Lord, that you would touch your word, that you would touch my mouth. And I just pray, Jesus, that your spirit, mingled with our spirits, Lord, would produce change. I ask, Heavenly Father, for your grace and mercy to cover us, and to go out from us, Lord, to all those who need it. Keep us, Lord, a balanced people. Protect us, Lord, in this time of turmoil. Cause us, Lord, to walk the way when the world's on one side and religion's on the other. Give us strength, Lord, that we might make it to the end by being on the road. We bless your name. Amen. Well, this message feels timely. I don't know why. I had it penciled. You know, like artists pencil things. I had it penciled a few weeks ago. And every time I went to go touch it, it was like, no, there's this other message i got to go do. And then I went to touch it, and no, there was this other message i got to go do. And today, this <laughs> message is here. So I have to assume that this is a timely message. The title of this message is... The power of personal faith. The power of personal faith. Now, there's a problem in the church. Oh, we already knew that, didn't we? There's a problem in the church. And it is mm, insidious at times and innocent at times. It's a problem that is masked because it looks like something else. And in the end... It kills. And it is only defeatable, fixable, or adjustable by this message. The power of personal faith. Now you know that for the last, mm, I don't know, tell my gang, how long has it been? Two months? Three months? I keep getting worked over on this issue of powerlessness. The church world being powerless. That we are, our, our battery as it were, after we've been running the laptop of religion for so long, you're starting to get a little on the low side. It started out a pretty good charged battery, and it just started decreasing. And there are many voices uh, who will tell you the cause and the reason and the whys and the wherefores, including mine. We will tell you what's going on. But the truth of the matter is, being good doctors and having great x-ray machines is not sufficient. What is sufficient is having the cure. And the cure to powerlessness partially is in this message. A problem started back in the days of the Catholics when the church was right after its power formation. The problem started in the days of heathen religions, way back before anybody knew anything else. Religion had the problem. The problem has some basis in truth, actually, in the Old Testament. In Old Testament truth, and even some New Testament truths. Because the funny thing about truth is, when truth is not balanced against truth, you end up with an imbalance. The net effect being a problem. Now, a problem is not something that's not overcomable. It's just a problem. You know, I have a problem. I keep falling in a hole. I trip whenever I step on this brick. You know, a problem. I stepped on a mossy rock and fell in the river. That's a problem. Not unrecoverable, not unchangeable, just a problem. Because of that problem, I felt like a balance needed to be taught, or a point needed to be made that would make us think about it just a little bit more. The problem is dependence on man dependence on man. The way this started for me, and I'll get to it in a moment, is my wife was reading a book that dealt with the Urim and Thummim. And I'll say that with as many M's as I can because I'm not Hebrew. And the Urim and Thummim was a place to go consult. And I'll get to a verse on that in a second. But that got me thinking about how we go to consult and that was just kind of brewing around in the back of my heart. 
And then one day, I was thinking about corporate faith. Corporate faith. And so the first part of this message is about corporate faith. The first verse that came to mind when it was brewing around was Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. In this little story, we see corporate faith. We see something that the church is based on, <clears throat> excuse me, and has uh, taught, explained, um, convinced its people that is absolutely necessary, and indeed it is. However, when overtaught against the subject I'm about to teach, it ends up hurting you as well. Let me read the story first and see if God can't take me out of first gear into second gear. Chapter 2. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. You know, like Carmen says, Jesus in the house. Straight may many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. Yeah, amen, Lord. And he preached the word unto them. Amen, Lord. And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. Oh, I'm sorry, why'd you do that? I thought we were supposed to stop at preaching. Bringing one sick of the palsy. Bringing somebody who's very, very, very far gone. Which was born, B-O-R-N-E, of four. Means he was being carried on the shoulders of four guys. Carried to the place that's crammed where Jesus is by them. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, i.e. crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. What wall? What barrier? What people? There's no problem here. It's a roof. It's movable. Let's move it. They let down, excuse me, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Now these are some pretty crafty guys. What did they bring? Ropes? Cloths? Did they figure out how to do it by some means of what was sitting right nearby? When Jesus saw, keywords, their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. That produced a conversation. How can he do that? Why can he do that? I don't get why he does that. And his final answer is, Arise, take up thy bed, go thy way into thy house. I have forgiven your sins and your sickness is gone. But notice something. He didn't say to the man, sick of the palsy, because of his sins, your faith saved you. He says in the narrative, these four guys had faith for him to lower him down, to get him there, in order for he would be healed. Now whether we realize it or not, the church being pressed about on all sides and very full, mm -hmm. even with Jesus in the midst, mm -hmm. sometimes can be in the way of getting somebody well. Can be in the way of a sick of the palsy getting to what he needs. And it is okay. God has no problem with the friends carrying somebody in for the healing. It has to be sometimes. And some of us are sick with the spiritual palsy. And some of us are spiritually lame and can't walk without a helper. And some of us are a little bit blind <clears throat> in one eye and deaf in one ear. And need a little guidance from our friends to get us to where we need to be so that we can let, be let down through the roof. Sometimes the roof has to be taken out of the way. Yep, sometimes you have to look at the edifice and say, 
it's in the way of getting to what I need. <clears throat> Jesus never rebuked them for tearing apart the house. I'm sure the owner of that fine house had work to do afterwards. That's what you get when you volunteer for the Lord sometimes. You lose your roof. Sometimes your church is going to get dismantled a little bit so that we can get the needy in here. Not just the ones who want to hear the sermons. Because that's all the ones that were there. They were all the ones listening for the word. But what about the power? What about the need for the power of God? I realized when I was thinking about this word, verse up against the Urim and Thummim, that, you know, we've been created to be dependent. It's okay. There's a time to be carried. This fella needed four pallbearers. He was about dead. He needed those pallbearers to get him there. That's okay. However, there comes a place where all that are sick think that they need pallbearers. If I only had friends who would carry me in. I've got scriptural grounds for it. I don't. I don't. They do. It's subtle. It's insidious. I need them to carry me in. The Bible says in James chapter 5, verse 14. Let's go there. James chapter 5. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay? And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Stop right there. This is exactly the same scene. No difference. If any man be sick, go get elders. Plural. Let them pray. But the prayer of faith is a corporate prayer. It's the prayer of the elders praying for the sick. And the scriptures are very clear that those who are in position, elders, those who have the tenure, elders, those who have been around a while and have served the Lord for a while, <coughs> should be very qualified to carry the load. Excuse me. The prayer of faith of the elders who are anointed with an anointing caring for the sick will heal the sick. Will save him. Will heal him. The Lord shall raise him up. And then forgive, it says in this case, <coughs> if he have committed sins. I find that significant. Because he may or may not have. Sickness is, is not always caused by sin. And sickness is not always caused by nature. But the point here is, when the corporate body works together to raise somebody up, the Lord does not have a problem with that. So where then is the problem? How did we end up with a problem? How did we end up in a place where now we can't even go to the Mass to get the healings? Something went wrong. The Urim and Thummim, I want to go back to that for a second. Exodus th uh, 28. Exodus 28, verse 30. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. My Bible has a footnote for that word bear. Have in mind, or to carry in, the burdens and the judgments of the people. And he will go in before the Lord and he will inquire. The people of God, from that day to this day, have always had an awareness, a sense, a consciousness, if you want to call it that, 
that if I find somebody who is in the anointed place, the appointed place, the chosen place, there's something about that person that's better than me. You say, but wait a minute, should that be? Sure, of course it should. Because if somebody is in that place and called in that place, in that function, they are better than you. They can get something you can't. He had Urim and Thummim. He could get answers for the people they couldn't get. Moses, Miriam, and Aaron got in an argument one day, and they said, we're all the same. Moses said, no, we're not. Allow me to demonstrate. But Moses did request forgiveness after the demonstration, and Aaron and Miriam got to be unleopard. There is a place where you don't touch God's anointed and do my prophets no harm. There is a place where you look up, not down. But there's also a place in that that says, how did he get that? It was appointed. Person to person, man to man. In the Old Testament, it was very, very, very common to go to somebody else to hear the word of the Lord. You had to know who that somebody else was. And usually the people knew. Let me go to a couple of verses. 1 Kings 22.7 First Kings 22, verse 7. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, besides that we might inquire of him? This is a leader of God's people, and he's saying, Don't, don't we have somebody around here who knows the voice of the Lord anywhere? Even Nebuchadnezzar when he had his dreams and his soothsayers couldn't get it right, had enough common sense as a leader to say, is there nobody around here who can give me my answer? I'm not getting it. And it's an important answer. And I need it. And I've got to have it. I can't make this next decision without it. Next thing you know, Daniel's brought in. Even Pharaoh understood that principle. Pharaoh, he's got problems. He's voicing his problems. And so he says, yeah, there's this guy down in prison, you know, this Joseph dude. And we hear tell that he solved the butcher problem and the baker problem and, the, you know, he told some things. Really? I need him now. If you look around the corporate world right now, we are bringing in consultants everywhere. We're not stupid. We know when we're outmatched, outflanked. We know when the decisions we've been making aren't quite right and we need something bigger than us. So we have consultants. We will pay hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to bring in the economic profit. The guy who can tell us what to do during the next economic collapse. To teach us what rich dads teach and poor dads don't. To teach us what was known but forgotten. To teach us the principles of business. All good. If the consultant is good. The leaders of this world, even our president, calls in periodically the prophets. Yeah. Yes, he does. And I've listened to several testimonies of people who have been summoned. People who have been told, hey, I hear you talk to God. Come here, I need to talk to you. All I'm trying to say in that is, look around. This is what we do. It's okay. But there's a weakness in it. There's a hidden weakness in it. 1 Kings 22 8. King of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Yeah, there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imlah by whom you may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. <laughs> yeah, I know who he is. 
I know where he is. I know what he is. And I don't like what he says. I don't like what he says. For he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Oh, yeah. There you have it. It's bad enough that we have to summon somebody. But can we get one of those guys that will tell us what we want to hear? Yeah. Oh, corporate CEO, we have discovered the correct answer to running corporate America. And it will be goodness for thee, O oh king. Just leave it as it is. Let it work itself out. Mm -hmm. Tear it down. I don't care, but it will work itself out. You don't have prophets walking and saying, yeah, economic ones for the moment, walking and saying, well, you know, I've looked your business over and uh, two years, you're dead. No, we summoned you in to tell us what was good. Mm, ain't enough good in it. Two years, you're dead. Oh, go away. Give me another consultant. Somebody's got to have a win-win scenario out here somewhere. The church isn't much different sometimes. Not much different sometimes. We know how we want to do our building program, our development program, our growing program, our advertising program. Just tell us, will billboards work? Just tell us, will walking down the street in a parade work? I just want to know. Sure! It's worked for other people. Why not? You're no different than anybody else. All of Israel's the same. Sure. If it worked for Moses once, it should work for you. If Jesus walked on water, then you should be able to, too, anytime you want. Absolutely right. See? Got it all worked out for you. Nice, good, positive message. I'm not trying to be sarcastic about it. I'm trying to say, hmm, itching ears? Going for advice? Not bad. Going to somebody who might know the word of the Lord. Somebody who knows their closet time. Somebody who has a conference on a regular basis with the head of the universe. Not a bad idea. On the other hand, Second Kings 3.11 Second Kings 3.11 Jehoshaphat, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may acquire of the Lord? <laughs> Why do you have to say it twice? I mean, isn't it the case that if it's the that it's the prophet of the Lord, we already know he's going to inquire of the Lord? Or are we worried about Balaam? One of the kings of Israel's servants answered, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Oh, different prophet. Yeah, there's a few guys running around who uh, we could inquire of. Now, don't you find it interesting that they knew where they were? They knew them by name? Why, we know exactly who in the church has healing ministry. We know exactly in the church who has some faith. And we know where to send you for advice, because we know who the wise ones are. We know. Sure we do. It's okay. Yeah, but, yeah, but, it's interesting Elijah's response. He says to the king of Israel, to the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and the prophets of thy mother. Go check with your own. Go check your papal bull. I listened to the Catholic channel the other day and Heard somebody quoting out of the papals and explaining to us why the end times were coming the way they were based on papal writings. Okay, maybe he's right, maybe he's not. Do we not do the same? Well, so and so is a prophet of God, and I quote him, and then so and so is a teacher of God, and I quote him, and so and so is a old time revivalist, I quote him, and I know I'm right because I quoted all those authoritative sources which I consulted. And somebody like myself, who's eclectic, somebody like myself, who prays over all kinds of things, hey, I've got the voice of the Lord for you. Yeah, I do. I can tell you what he has said. 
I can tell you tell you how he said it. But can I tell you what you need to hear? Is this message timely? I could give you a message, but is it timely? Some pastors rotate their messages through a file box. They have a set number of sermons. Some pastors go to the How to Make a Sermon program and make a sermon. God might even anoint it. I'm not saying he wouldn't. But they're consulting. Consulting somebody that they trust. Somebody that they believe in. A program that they accept. They're putting their faith and dependence on history. And history is what it is. His story. Man's story. We like reading stories about revivals. We like reading stories about the old days. And we look forward to the new days. But there comes a place and a time when none of that means anything. Because now you're the one who's stuck with palsy. You're the one who's stuck with a problem. You're the one that's got to do something about it. And you say, is there not a prophet among us? Is there not a healer among us? In 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 8, the king says unto Hazel, Elijah's in town, you know. He happened to be passing by a verse earlier. Take a present in thy hand, and go meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? Shall I recover of this disease? Or am I dead? Notice, he had to wait till Elisha came to town. Notice in the ministry of Christ, one minute he was in Capernaum, next minute he was somewhere else. Any given voice we go to is only going to be in one place at a time. Can't be everywhere at all times. Human beings are not omnipresent. If we are dependent on omni-not-present people, <laughs> then we will be chasing from revival to revival to revival after the ones who are our source. <clears throat> a good thing becomes a bad thing when it's not balanced by other good things. A truth is solid until its counterweights are missing. Faith, grace, hope versus obedience, long-suffering, patience <laughs> versus sit still, shut up, and listen. Mm -hmm. Counterweights. Leave one and the scale starts spinning. It's okay to go and say, I need to know from the Lord. Am I going to die? Am I spiritually in a funk? I asked the Lord that one time, Lord, what's my spiritual diagnosis? Please tell me my current spiritual condition. Amazing how fast he answered that question. Absolutely amazing. Ten other questions I had up longer than that one. But that one got instant telephone time. I remember that. It has served well in my life to uh, periodically go to the dock and ask the question. I have to admit, in all fairness and honesty as a human being, I don't always want to hear the answer. So I go consult somebody else. I'm kidding. But it's what we do. What if the answer the Lord gave us is not the answer the Lord gave us? Shouldn't we go find confirmation somewhere else? The Lord says, fix of that. We go, I don't know if I want to fix of that. Uh, is there another voice around here? <laughs> In the current prophetic movement, What's the best, best thing it offers? You know? I do. Encouragement. Hope, that's right. Exactly right. Go to some place to be laid hands on on the hopes of having somebody talk to you, but my God, you better not tell me something negative. Because I'm not going to hear it if you tell me something negative. Because God wouldn't do that. I want to hear that I'm going to prosper, be in health even as my soul prospers. And that eternity is coming around the corner in a flashing light. 
I don't want to know about speed bumps, divots, dips. I don't want to know about wells being covered up that I have to undig. I do not want to know about having to plumb the depths to get the oil so that I can have the fuel to patrol my car. I just want somebody to hand it to me. Is there not a prophet in town who can tell me the truth? Is it a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing. Is it a dangerous thing? Yes, it's a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. Second Kings. Mm -hmm. Hope I have that. Right. 22, 12 to 13. Yes. The king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Hakim the son of Shaphan and Akabor the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the scribe. And I think I need to go live in Israel for a year. <laughs> a servant of the king saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that I found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto <coughs> the words of this book, to do according to all that which is written concerning us. That inquire, my footnote Bible says, pray to. Uh, I need to find me an intercessor. I need to find me an intercessor because uh, this book isn't being listened to. <laughs> uh, hold the phone. Hold the phone. How much scripture is given in the average church sermon on a Sunday morning? Half a verse? I told this last week, I'll tell it again. A friend of mine, who's Irish Catholic family background in Ireland, said, quote, The preacher has 30 minutes to get it all done, from communion all the way through the message. At 30 minutes... If he is not done, even if he's talking, they all get up and leave. <laughs> 30 minutes, God. You're on the clock. 30 minutes for me to come inquire of the Lord through you to tell me what I need to know so that I can go back to my life. Perfectly content that I have inquired of the Lord, fulfilled my duties, and kept my walk. Hearken unto the book. We have not hearkened unto the book. So now we need somebody who, what can pray. Because we haven't hearkened unto the book. So then we have the reverse thing going on. We're all hearkening unto the book. We come in for the preaching. We fill the house for the preaching. And the sick can't get in. I'm talking about more than just physical sickness. The needy can't get time with their elders. The needy can't find somebody on the block that's got enough spiritual uh, space, uh, open windows, uh, open opportunities in heaven. I'm sorry, but I have another appointment with Pastor So-and-so at 3. Could you come back next Sunday? Then we will inquire of the Lord on your behalf. The Old Testament unfortunately came through into the New Testament community when Catholicism and leadership realized that the people were getting duller and duller and they had to codify everything for them. So we had creeds and councils which if you think about it was actually a good move. We cannot afford to lose the truth. We cannot have it dropped to the ground so we will form councils to put together the truth in such a way that people will get the point since they are not reading the word anymore. In some cases, didn't have the word to read. Fair enough. Fair enough. So we will make sure that they know what to believe. Thereby, we will control false doctrine. We will control error. We will eliminate wildfire. And they will be able to come check with us any time they want to see if they're in line. After all, does not the Scripture teach there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors? 
Doesn't it teach that? Isn't that the model? Sure it is. Proverbs 11.14. Let me read it to you. Proverbs 11.14. I just quoted this verse myself to somebody the other day in a conversation. Let's read the verses that go together. Proverbs 11.14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And so, the person I was talking to, I said, I have come to you to hear your advice. And I want you to know you're not the only person I've come to. In times past, I talked to so-and-so. <clears throat> Do you know so-and-so? They said, yes, I know so-and-so. Very wise person. And I've spoken to so-and-so. <clears throat> yes, another wise person. And I've spoken to so-and-so. I don't know that person. And now I'm talking to you. And I will take all of what you have to say, all of you, and I will go have to talk to God about that too. Because yes, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors, and <coughs> one of the members of your committee should be the Lord. But mankind typically forgets to put him on the committee, saying, no, you shouldn't be going by that which you think you've received. You should be confirming it across the board in a multitude of confirmations. Confirmations? Okay. But let me ask you a question. If you're the 401st prophet and 400 of them have confirmation, what do you do? If you're the young prophet and you've been given a command and you go up and an old prophet says, yeah, but I heard from an angel, and I'm older and smarter than you, I'm an elder. What do you do? Do you decide to just throw over what you know? On the other hand, isn't it a bit arrogant to think, you know, hey, you've been receiving something that others haven't been getting? I mean, are you really, I mean, is there any private interpretation to anything, really? No, no, a multitude of counselors are essential to keep you safe. Yes, it can keep you safe. If the counsel, in every case, comes from the Lord. There is a balance to corporate faith, corporate inquiry, corporate, please go up and seek the Lord for me. There is strength in it. But let me ask you another question. Somebody's got a major sickness. How many people need to pray for that sickness to go away? We put it on the telephone line. The e we put it on the Internet. Please pray for me. Why? Because we want lots of people responding. Because we believe in corporate response. If I put a prayer out on the prayer line and a hundred people respond, I know God's listening. Now, we don't say it that way. What we say is, I know I've got support from the body. What you're really saying is, I have given myself to the body. Not bad, but it holds a weakness. Not wrong, but it holds a weakness. Proverbs 15.22 Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors... They are established. Plans can get confused. But if you have a good counsel together, then it all works out just fine. We shouldn't do anything, therefore, without council meetings, should we? We shouldn't do anything without our board meetings, our board of directors, our uh, sources of balance to make sure that we are not turning into the renegade... <clears throat> the one outside of the mark, the one that's not quite part of society, the cult member, so-called, the isolationist person, so-called. We've got to make sure we don't do that, right? So let's just forget all this personal stuff and go back to corporate stuff. Wisdom in a multitude of counselors is good if we recognize that we also are on the panel. That's the second member we left off the council. <laughs> That's why I said there's a sliver of error hiding in it. If our view 
of wisdom and a multitude of counselors is it's always all of them and doesn't include me on the panel. And it's always all of them, but it doesn't include him on the panel. Then your counselor, team, advisory staff, board, is missing two extremely crucial members. And guess what? This time it affects your life. This time it's going to affect your faith. This time it's going to deal with your future. I find and have found in the past there are two kinds of Christians in general when it comes to this topic. I don't need nobody. The Lord leads me. I am solo flying. And then there's the other one. I don't believe I should count on anything unless I have a thousand percent confirmation all across the board. Hmm. This is a problem. Ditches, ditches, everywhere ditches, and not a wheel to ride on. <laughs> Next verse. I'm moving slow this morning. Proverbs 24, 6. Twenty-four six. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety. By wise counsel. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I guess we should invite her, too. Which her? Wisdom. You know the one in the book of Proverbs who says, I form the world? The metaphorical explanation of God's own nature that says, by wisdom I created everything? If I can be a little bit humorous here, we better make a seat for her too. We don't just need the Lord, all God Almighty. We also need the any man lacketh wisdom, I will give it to you liberally, member on the panel. She is a member. She says very definitively, listen to me and I will prosper you. Ignore me and in the day of your calamity, I'm going to be laughing my head off. And that's not a very nice thing to say, don't you think? So wisdom should be on our counselor's panel, too. And yes, we will make war based on that. It is a must. If you haven't noticed, we are in a state of war. I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about the church. America and the natural worlds are just but a dim reflection of the war that's going on right now in the heavenlies. In case you haven't noticed, strange people blowing up good people for bad reasons are doing it in the name of spirits named. That makes it a spiritual war, not a natural one. We are not fighting culture against culture, nation against nation, or ethnos against ethnos. We are fighting principality against principality. We are fighting darkness. We are wrestling Oh, I know, that's like a nice term, wrestling. We're getting beat, pummeled, and smashed. And we better hurry up and figure out how to beat, pummel, and smash back correctly. Or we will continue to have borders broke down, supply lines cut off, in case you haven't noticed the price of gas lately, supply lines getting cut off, innocent people dying for religious reasons, in and out of the church. The war is on. And powerless will not do. Luke. 14.31 What king going to make war against another king sits not down first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. War councils are a wise thing. Absolutely count the cost. However, let us not forget how the great general, the man of war, conducts war. Gideon, gather some men together. We're going to have a war. Okay, let's chisel these guys out. They're afraid. Let's chisel these guys out. They don't drink water right. 
<laughs> Boy, that sounded like a stupid thought. Let's get you down to, they've got more than you. Now, wait a minute. Wisdom says, hey, by 10,000, go out to meet him who has 20,000. Yeah, you know, you don't start a war, you know, you don't pick a fight with the bully down the street when his muscles look like this and you look like this. <laughs> it is a wise person living in the inner city who says, if there's markings on the wall, I go to the other side of the street and walk over here. Because there's one little me and a gang of them. And I can't make war with that. Wisdom, councils, advisory panels, all very good for assessing the war room. But when it comes down to getting the fight done, one guy holding back something in his tent is going to cost you a battle at AI. If the battle plan was to leave it behind. Mm -hmm. Great counsel, guys. Great counsel didn't find out what was going on in your own backyard to know that that wisdom wasn't sufficient because it lacked a little personal touch of leadership. We didn't check to make sure that we had complied with the Lord's directive. Imagine that one guy at the tail end of all the guys walking around Jericho who just decided one day he was really tired of blowing trumpets. So he faked it. <laughs> It didn't happen, I guarantee you. Because <laughs> I'm sure they were all watching each other. And if any one of them was not paying attention because they were too busy looking at the walls of Jericho wondering how it was going to come down and they forgot to blow on the trumpet, somebody had slapped them from behind. Said, put your trumpet up. We're getting ready to blow. All trumpets up now. Well, I don't feel like blowing a trumpet today. I'm not in the mood. Yeah. Yeah, you are. You know, I'm going to slap you upside the head and you will be in the mood. Because that wall's got to come down. The plan. Yes, we assessed it. Jericho's bigger than us. Their walls are thicker than us. We are a bunch of ex-slaves from Egypt who've never lifted a weapon. We've assessed it. And the Lord has said, yeah, and I'll take care of it. The ten spies came back with their advice too, remember? They went for a council meeting. They looked up and said, we be grasshoppers. They be giants. God said, Bad council meeting. Bad council meeting. What did you two guys think? Oh, we can go get it. We can go get it. Uh-huh. Okay. Unfortunately, you guys made a committee decision. Therefore, as a committee, 40 years. See you on the other side, guys. Sometimes the battle can only be what the Lord tells us the battle be. But here's the catch. Okay, ready? A council that doesn't come back with a rendering of faith, just looking at natural eyed wisdom by the natural man and natural means, based on natural principles of business, spirituality, religion, or otherwise, are going to end up bleaching their bones in the wilderness until the next revival comes from their children. Check history. Yep. So again, wisdom... The masses seem to be right, and God keeps going, no, I'm done here. And he waits. Will we realize how important we are individually to the future, to the plan, to the purpose, to our destinies? Doesn't matter how old we are. Believe in wisdom in a multitude of counselors believe in being on that panel. Ephesians 4.11. Let's move on to the next point. Ephesians 4.11. I'm not even done with the first half of this message yet. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come, all come into the unity of the faith. Mm -hmm. There you have it. Church government perfectly formed church government, and Christ appointed it. But we forget to look at what it is. What is the apostle? The apostle is a man who's listening all the time to the Lord on how to raise something up. Go read the apostolic letters of Paul 
to his pastor, friend Timothy. And you'll see that he's spiritually astute, spiritually in tune, watching over the flock, constantly paying attention, giving Timothy some advice on how to get his spirituals in order, how to take care of natural problems in his assembly with spiritual answers. He's giving sound advice. The prophets are in there. Did you notice God gave his prophets? He could have left us without them. You know, you need the prophets. The prophets are of value. <coughs> Every one of these offices, every one of these functions serve to build us up. I believe and have believed that one must be very careful about trying to cut the coat off of Saul. We have to be careful when we think our religious leadership aren't doing their religious duties correctly. And we think we're going to rise up and say, I don't have to pay regard to you. Because they do hold some spiritual weight. On the one hand, respect. On the other hand, what goes in the other hand? <laughs> Personal faith. Hence the message. On the one hand, they are accountable to God. On the other hand, they are accountable to praying people. Let's see. Moody was standing up there preaching, and two little <coughs> ladies said, You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, I want you praying for these people. They said, No thanks, we'll be praying for you. And then you'll do a better job with these people. <laughs> it's called body ministry. Because the body really can do some things, not just the heads. If we go to, oh, before I go there, let me go to the one verse, one more verse. Hebrews uh, 13. Hebrews 13. 17 to 18. Haven't thought about this verse for a long time. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Hmm. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. Okay, so, obey, and all religions will teach you obedience. They've got it to an art. Every religion. I said earlier, whether Catholic or heathen, they teach strong lines of obedience. Strong lines of surrender. Because it is the case of leadership to watch over souls. On the other hand, this leader was very wise. He makes that statement, and then he says, pray for us. <laughs> Half a verse later. Take away the 18 and move it up and do a little word pasting here, you know, and cut it up and put it in the previous verse. Makes a really nice counterbalance. Pray for us. Here's the way it is. Obey. Pray for us. We're watching you. Pray for us. We're going to give you advice. Pray for us. And when our time comes where we need advice, where do we go? Number one problem in Christian leadership is where do they go? They don't know where to go. Because guess what? They can't go back to their people. Because here's what happens to people. Oh, the man of God is so great, so wonderful, so knowledgeable, so experienced, so spiritual, so understanding. Then they find out the man of God's got a problem. Any problem. doesn't matter what the problem is. Ooh, I didn't know that. Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. Boy. Next sermon, the man of God, the great man of God preaches. Hmm. I wonder if that's true. Little tummy problem. <laughs> Having a little bit of uh, authority indigestion. Not quite sure I can trust him. And did you hear what else I knew about what he did or she did or they did? Ooh. Oh, I didn't know that either. I had somebody one time said to me not too long ago about two men of God that I named that I admire. The person very politely said, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, did you know that recently they were exposed to having 
certain sins that um, now they're under reprimand in the church for? Perhaps you should not consider quoting them right now. They're not exactly in popularity, you know. Hmm. Whoops! There went my idol. <laughs> Slipped right off the pedestal and became human. Changed from being painted white to being painted pink. <laughs> oh dear! How can I serve that? How can I consult that? How can I go to that? No, I must find me another one. I must find me another church who's got the anointing. I must find me another source. I must find me another place. Because I have lived off of... I've lived off of source. I'm not saying it's bad to go from church to church. Do you understand where I'm going here? All things could be good in this case. Maybe there is a time to go and time to stay. But wait! Check your motives at the door. Check your leadings at the closet. Check your committee. Make sure they're listening. You know, ten people together having a gossip session is not wise counsel. <laughs> Equally, ten people coming together having a polyatty, oh, you'll be great meeting, is not wise counsel. There is only one kind of wise counsel. Obey them that are listening to wise counsel. And keep looking for them. Keep seeking them out. But again I say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's going to be told it most of all? It's your life, too. It's your future, too. It's your calling, too. And there's a lot of souls hanging on your calling. Oh, I hate that one. There's a lot of souls hanging on my calling. There's a lot of souls hanging on your calling. God sets up the dominoes and tips one. And we have what we call it a movement. Change and mass. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 28, 1 to 28, I could read you the whole thing. I was planning on reading you the whole thing. I'm going to make you go read the whole thing because I think I need to keep moving on. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 to 28. You need to read that whole segment and realize how much the body takes care of the body. But guess what? Even that segment of scripture is bogging us down. Knock, knock. Do you have a word of the Lord for me? I need a word of the Lord, please. Knock, knock. Can I check with you? Uh, can I come over and visit with you? I just, I just want to, you know, let's sit down and see what the Lord will do, okay? Just you, me, the Lord. Because I know you're gifted, see? and I know you're, I know you get the word of the Lord, and I, I know you get visions and dreams, and and I know you, I know your gift of healing, yeah, yeah, and I know your wisdom, yeah, I know. But which comes first? the committee or the person when you do your advice search when you do your prayer search when you get on your spiritual Google and say who hath the mind of the Lord uh, let's say I'll try uh, Benny Hinn I'll try a little bit of uh, Papa Hagen maybe a little bit of D.O.B. maybe a little bit of you know a little bit of a little bit of ah there's my advice I found it meanwhile Gabriel's standing next to you with a message. <laughs> and you don't see him because your gift's not on. Meanwhile, the Word of God is sitting here blinking red because the phone has been dialing. <laughs> Ever had the Bible blink red at you? Ever walk by it and feel like you heard a bell ring? Yeah, I, I have. You walk by it and it goes, I should have read it yesterday. <laughs> you walk by it and you go, duck. <laughs> you walk by it and go, not sure. <clears throat> 1,700 years of advice, right here. Uh, can I have a word of the Lord, please? <laughs> yes, there is a prophet locked up on my bookshelf. But it doesn't always speak well to me. <laughs> the gifts of the Spirit bring us to a place where we can be changed. However, 
they can also bring us to a place, a dependency on man, whereby our change is predicated upon what they say. The problem here is putting all this good truth together I just said, all of which are true and wonderful truths, it can bring us to a place where deep down inside we say, without meaning to say it, everyone else hears God. Everyone else knows God. Everybody else sees God better than I do. Better than I do. And our dependence then becomes addictive. Addictive. When I'm in a stuck then I have to find somebody quick. When I'm up against my health battle, and it's gone longer than three days and three nights, and I haven't been raised from the dead, obviously I'm not good enough, or God's not listening to me, or something's wrong here, I must needs go find me a wiser than me. There's a time and a place for a wiser than me. And there's a time and a place for become wiser much, much wiser. Here's the problem. Dependence on those who are anointed, dependence on the church which is anointed, dependent on knowing those who know the voice of the Lord. I know you talk to the Lord and get answers. I know you talk to the Lord and get answers. I know you talk to the Lord and get answers. Can, can, lead you to the following next set of verses. And if you don't believe I'm telling the truth on this, Go look at the youth who have left Christianity after I read this verse. 1 Samuel 28. Five through eleven. Verse five. When Saul saw the host of the Philistines he was afraid and his heart greatly troubled. Yesterday we were okay, but today there's a massive army of demonic influence coming right at my face. Today there's a giant about this big and he's saying, Send me a man! I will fight with him! And if he wins, we will serve you! And if I win, you will serve us. Send me a man. And the day of confrontation hits, and it's rough. And he's loud, and he's noisy, and he stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been standing out there. The day comes when all of a sudden an army marches up against your walls, and you don't know what to do. And the first reaction is always fear. It is. It's fear. But here's the difference. Watch what Saul did. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, hey, that was good. He inquired of the Lord. He did. The Lord answered him not. Why didn't the Lord answer him? Because in this case, he was supposed to be listening to corporate anointing. The prophet said, don't do anything. And the prophet said, don't do anything until I get there. And he didn't listen back then. And then he started a pattern, and the pattern killed him, and God said, you're losing the kingdom. So here we have Saul later still wanting answers. He didn't like the answer the prophet gave him. I find this an interestingly painful verse. Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. All of a sudden, it's stone quiet across the body of Christ. So what does Saul do? Does he throw himself on the soil and rent his clothes and say, Oh Lord, what have I done? 
Does he do a Nineveh and say, Oh my God, I'm going to be destroyed in 40 days. We will make ourselves a fast and we will put away our fancy clothes and we will put away ourselves and we will throw ourselves down on the mercy of God? Does he do that? Does he do like Peter, who afterwards having failed miserably his test, throw himself down and weep bitterly? No. No, he says, well, i got to get to the Lord somehow, and I'm used to getting it from you guys, and you guys aren't coming through. I don't get no dreams. I don't get no Urim. Can you imagine going to the priest with the Urim and you don't get no Urim? The thing don't blink. The anointing not there. And person after person says, I don't know why, Lord, not give me an answer for you. I don't know why. I'm sorry, brother, sister. Can't answer you on this one. I can't answer you on this one. I guess you're going to have to go find out. He says this, Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit. Ouch. Ouch. That's where the occult comes in. Mm -hmm. That's where dependency on corporate spiritual knowledge gets shifted from the light to the dark. And the children of the gospel go to hang out in coven meetings. And the children of religion go to Goth. <laughs> and behold, they went down to Goth. <laughs> I didn't say Gath. Because the dependency on spiritual outside insight is so ingrained now, and you're not getting it from where you were supposed to thinking you were supposed to get it from, then maybe I should go elsewhere. I had somebody say to me uh, two weeks ago, in their despair, well, Maybe I'll just go to the go go to the occult because obviously walking with God's not working. Painful statement. Fortunately, my discernometer said that's just a big bunch of black yick coming out. It'll go away. However, it's a dangerous thing to say. What happens when the church no longer has? The Urim responding, the prophets responding, the church leadership <coughs> responding, elders aren't giving good advice, it's not working anymore, where do the people go? I will get me down to a... Go ahead, pick your source. It isn't always the witch. Sometimes it's something else. Because we are so dependent on getting it from somewhere instead of standing still and seeing the salvation of God instead of standing perfectly still, instead of renting our hearts and our garments, instead of becoming of a contrite spirit, melting down in a puddle. Balance. When Saul went to the witch of Endor, it's interesting because she got upset. She said, you're trying to trick me. I know that you've been wiping them out. <laughs> See, he disguised himself and it didn't work. <coughs> Tried to fake it. She saw right through him. And she said, you're here because you're testing me. You have cut off those that have familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. You've been wiping them out. And now you're coming to me for advice? See, dependency on somebody else as your source, you're going to start going to places where you think the door's open. An open door isn't always an open door, and a closed door isn't always a closed door. Where is the answer? Who's it coming from? Having said all of that, having s described all of our condition in that way, knowing that that which is good can turn bad sometimes, even if it was good, we then have to say, what's the counterweight? And I believe the counterweight is so simple. Hence the title of the message. Personal faith is your own rudder. No matter how you triangulate the rest of your path. Your hand's on the wheel. The storms may change, but your hand's on the helm. The advice coming in across the speaker system may change, but your hand's on the helm. It's your ship. It's your future. It's our ship. It's our future. And we have many passengers aboard. When we decide to depend strictly 
in abject confidence and don't do our own due diligence, we can sink the ship. We can sink the ship. Our own and somebody else's. Because we're not trying. We're just not trying. We could have been the source. But instead we're the receiver of the source. And if the source doesn't seem to come through there anymore, then all of a sudden we don't know what to do. It's okay to follow leadership. It's okay to consult the gifts. It's okay to go after these things. But now, let us talk about personal faith. When Jesus started his ministry with his people, his focus was 100% on the individual. Later, scriptures teach us body ministry, authority structure, interdependence of the body. But when it starts out, 12 guys, 70 guys, dependence is personal. Very personal. The first thing that Jesus says to people when they start coming around is he says, you got to believe in me. 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 What happens if we put a human being above Jesus Christ? What happens if our church board is more important than the voice of the Lord? What happens if our advisor's voice is louder than the voice of God within us? First, excuse me, John 14.1. <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. When he first came on the scene, they didn't even know who he was to believe in him. They had to make a personal decision of faith on a man they'd never met. At the request of that man saying, I know you. You believe in God. Now believe in me too. Don't be afraid to believe in me. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Belief is personal. It starts there. And the body belief that we have follows. If the body belief ever turns the church upside down and Jesus is on his head, that's a picture, then the church is walking on its hands, not its feet, and it isn't going to go as far. Because we've put man and dependence on man higher than personal dependence on the man. We have to keep it straight. John 6.35 Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall not hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. How many people are believing on church and are stuck in hunger and thirst? Look at my face. Now look right through my face. Don't ever get stuck on my face. Look through my face. See the face of him who's behind me. Then see my face. Do not see my face first, and then the face of him behind me. That is the only correct attitude that any leader, any leader in the Christian community should take. I am mortal. I die daily. <laughs> He's not. When he says, I'm the bread of life, he means, I feed you. I may be his messenger, we may be his advisors, we may be his prophets, we may be his teachers, we may be his whatevers, but he be the voice, and we be the mouth lips. He be the heartbeat, we be the pa-bump, pa-bump that you get to hear. Because he's invisible, I have to be visible. And that is the church. When the church starts thinking it's the invisible, then the invisible is no longer visible. Period. G 
Jesus says, believe in me. John 7.38 John 7.38 He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But we say, he that is perfectly submitted unto church government, out of him shall flow an anointing. But I say, if every one of us were a well, and we had a pump, we'd have a whole lot more water than we got right now. The water's there. It's there. The oil was always there. Thousands of years, oil was under the ground. And nobody had an automobile. They had horses. <laughs> but the oil was always there. Water in the Holy Ghost has always been there. It's been there since Jesus went up and it came down. And the firmament spiritually parted. And we have water under the Spirit that used to be above the Spirit. Ooh, think about it. Now, the question is, who do you believe in? He that believes on me, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. No, it's he who believes in what the prophet has spoken. That's who gets the anointing. No, it's the person who believes this fine teacher who's been around for 35 years, been on the radio, and has a good life and a good marriage and a good... That's the person you believe on, because if you believe in him, you're going to be balanced, brother, and that's where the anointing is going to come from. Oh, we don't say it out loud. Come on, we wouldn't dare. We wouldn't dare. It's the way we speak about him that makes that happen. Yeah, I went down and saw so-and-so the other day in a revival meeting. Oh, him? Well... Uh, I go to this church over here, uh, this Baptist church, or this Baptist you know, church. I go to that church over there, and that man I got, and that woman I got. You know, that, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's really where it's at. If you came over here to our place, you know, you wouldn't be in that unanointed state. If you came over to our place, oh, man, the glory just falls 24-7. Because our place has more anointing than your place, and my team's hotter than your team. And, and... Oh, we do it so Christianized. Come on. We're still doing high school cliques at the, at the age of Christian Church 2000. The truth of the matter is, believe on me. Get to me. Touch me. Touch my hem of my garment. Get to me. That's where dunamis flows out from. Now, can I do that by going through the body? Absolutely. Absolutely. If I'm next to a man that's anointed, I can get anointed. If I listen to a man who's anointed in teaching, I get anointed. If I'm near somebody who operates the gifts, I can sometimes even tap in and get on those gifts. Tim Story proved that in a meeting I was at. Mm -hmm. Hey, you, come up here. I want to show you how to do what I do. Come here. He did to her what Jesus did to his disciples. Here, I'll just let you know how to do it. Here's what I want you to do. You're here with me. I'm anointed. We're in this bubble. We'll call the anointing. They're not. We are. That's the way it is. Okay, go. Anointed people can anoint people. Right. Filled people can fill people. Right. And anybody with a decent generator can put out 220 volts if they plug it in somewhere. Yeah. But the body of Christ has many other solutions for our powerless problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to keep hammering on this till I die and or have bigger church and or die and or, <laughs> or come to life in absolute, you know what I mean. Give not up, saith me. <laughs> Jesus never got off that. We, we, we've gotten to the point where, of course, of course it's Jesus. Well, you know, we all know it's Jesus. Do we really? Do we really say, I believe in you, fill me? Or do we say, I don't believe in myself, I don't think you can fill me? Because I'm now looking at me. Because I got so used to looking at all these other people. I mean, looking at me in the mirror is just another people to look at. John 11:25. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes on me, though he were dead, huh? yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Believest thou this? I'm going to put a personal test of your personal faith right here. Believe. Do you believe? I want to know what you believe. What do you believe? That's personal faith. I don't want to know what your church believes. I don't know what your leader believes. I don't want to know what your creeds say. I don't want to know what your statement of faith is. I don't want to know. I want to know what you believe. What do you believe? Now, you might believe what your statement of faith says, and you might believe what your creed says, and you might believe those things, but then we're going to have to ask the question, did Jesus believe that? And when that's all done, what are you hanging your hook on? 
John, uh, 1246. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me shall not abide in darkness. I just can't figure out why I'm groping so much. And nobody in the church can help me. And my friends don't seem to have the answers. And the doctors don't know. And the grope, 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 grope. Do we not know the source? Do we not have the light? Have we not been summoned? <clears throat> uh, called? Uh, okay. Requested to do something? Uh, asked to be something? We've been summoned. Jesus first taught his people, hang on me. He also taught his people the reminder statement, which we have quoted before, Mark 11, 22. I bet you can probably quote it faster than I can get to it. Have faith in God. I wonder how many verses there are that say, have faith in church. I wonder how many verses there are that say, have faith in your brethren. How many verses does it say, have faith in your denomination? Matter of fact, have faith in that revival. We should have faith in that revival. I know what we should have faith in. We should have faith in me. It's me. I'm a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. I'm a child of the king. Have faith in me. Uh, I think we'll stick with Jesus as being the only one who says, uh, you believe in God, believe in me also. But if we step up, we will say, I believe in him, believe in me also. Not a bad thing to say, not a bad thing to have. Mm -hmm. But what do you believe? You first, everybody else second. <coughs> Where is your belief was the other thing that Jesus hit very hard when he talked to his people. What do you believe? Where is your belief? Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. A little litmus test, please. What do you believe? All things are possible. Really? All things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're in the right church. All things? Yeah, if you're among the most anointed people. All things? Sure, if you've got the right training. All things? Well, that depends on what seminary you came from. All things? Yes, all things. Are him to him that believes. How's your belief mechanism doing? Forget for a moment the what and the who. You. What about your belief mechanism? Do you know that you can grow your belief mechanism? You can strengthen your belief mechanism? You can not only believe in the who, you can also figure out how to increase your faith. That's what Wigglesworth's book, book was called, Ever Increasing Faith. How do you increase your belief? See, if you're just believing in a person, place, or thing, then you're likely to fall. Even if you believe in the truth, sometimes you can fall. But when you turn yourself into a believer, and it's part of your nature to believe, and you know what your belief is because you've tested it time and time again, you've seen Jesus do it time and time again, now you become what God was not, you'll become what Israel didn't become. Let's say it that way. They kept forgetting all the miracles God did for them and murmured and complained and fussed. You will become the person who remembers all the things the Lord taught you and the people around you, and you will know the next time what you're being taught, and you will believe. Mark 9.23. Is that where I was going? I think I lost my place. No, I just read that one. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. Believing on him who sent me, but it's your belief. Matthew 6.30 
Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, ye of little faith? Believing about your provision, increase your faith. He clothes everything else. Why won't he cover you? A lot of people get this idea that they have to ask God if it be his will. <coughs> Why wouldn't he will? He loves poverty, right? He loves seeing people beaten down, pummeled, and destroyed, powerless, pointless, and purposeless. He thinks it's a great thing, right? Come on. No matter how we candy coat religion, it always kills us. God likes strong, healthy bodies drinking milk <laughs> and eating meat. And eating meat. Matthew 8, 26. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Eliminate your fear. Get back on your platform of faith. Watch out. Fear is what drove Saul to go to the witch of Endor. Get rid of it. Fear will kill you. And me and anybody else who decides to partake of it. O ye of little faith, this is Matthew 16, 8. Why reason ye among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Remember that scenario? Real simple. Now they can't figure out even how to feed people. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, the airlift supply didn't come in today. I guess we're all dead. Where is your personal faith? Personal faith may override some very bad natural circumstances. When Peter walked on the water, how did he do it? How did he do that? Matthew fourteen twenty five to 31. How did he do that? He looked up. He looked at the Lord. He said, Is it you? The voice said, Yes. He said, Okay. I'm in. Actually, he was on. Later, he looked at his feet, whoops, looked at the water, whoops, and he wasn't on, he was in. <laughs> his personal faith determined how far he was going to walk on water. That passage has become rather uh, significant to me this week. There's a song that, that is played by one of the groups, uh, my CD, uh, Bar Becker and Ashton and I can't remember who. Thank you. And uh, they have a chorus, walk on, walk on, walk on. And I always hear it the same way. Walk on, walk on, walk on water. I can't get the word water out of my head when I hear the chorus. Walk on, walk on, walk on water. Yeah, that's the walk on. It's one thing to walk on, walk on, walk on dirt. <laughs> we all walk on, walk on, walk on religion, Christianity, corporality. How about walk on, walk on, walk on, and climb up and get all the gifts of the Spirit operative? Walk on. What about walk on higher ground? What about walk in the Spirit? What about walk on? You can only do that with your personal faith. You can't do that off the faith of others. You can't do that off the faith of your leadership. You can't do that off the faith of the history and the past. Prophets of God! You can do that off of yourself. If you can see Jesus up there. When Moses parted the Red Sea, how did he do it? Exodus 14, 15. I'll tell you how he did it. God said, stop whining. What do you got in your hand? What's in your hand? He picks it up in the sea parts. Personal faith. As long as that stab was in his hand and he hadn't personalized it yet, it was pointless. As long as he was still getting to God going, what did you want us to do? And it hadn't come down to, what do you got in your hand? It wasn't personalized yet. That's why God initially made him take his hand and put it in his bosom. It came out leprous. So he'd see it on his hand, put it back in his bosom, pull it out well, so he'd see it on his hand. So it would be personal faith. Personal belief. Even if Aaron was the one doing the yakking. <laughs> because when it came time for Aaron to shut up, Moses better be able to pull a plug out of his pocket. <laughs> when the sermon's over, somebody better have a staff. Somebody better have signs and wonders following. Somebody better be plugged in so that we can then go across dry land. When Moses was in battle against the Amalekites, I think it was. I'm not going to go there right now. 
Exodus 17, verses 9 to 16. When they were in battle, how did the battle go? Well, it went up and it went down and it went up and it went down. When his staff was up, they win. When the staff came down, they lose. Two very wise individuals said, Ah, leadership needs support. Let's get some rocks. And sit him down. <sighs> That was the first thing they did. And then they said, and that rod needs some help too. Let's get it up. <laughs> oh, I like that. The man of God gets to sit down and the body ministry gets to lift up. Oh, I like that. But it was personal faith in Moses, coupled with personal faith of Moses, that made a personal victory that day. And it was the sword of the Lord and of Gideon that made the victory that day. It'll always be that way. When we get to the place where we're balancing corporate faith with personal faith, the victory is ours. Everybody is a warrior. Everybody is an archer. Everybody is a something. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, when we shoot an arrow into the air, it isn't just going to go somewhere. Now I won't box the air, you know, like I'm shadow boxing. I'm going to smack something in the nose every time I shoot. Because my personal faith's got aim. When Jesus came on the scene, he sent them out in his name. That was personal. Not corporate. They went out and they did personal miracles. For anybody who let them in their doors. That's what he said. If you go into their house, knock on their door, Put the blessing on the house. What blessing? The blessing I told you to put on their house. Well, how did they do that? And that fellow that wasn't even with them, that went and did the same thing that they got all upset about, personal faith. Not even part of the crew. Not even part of the denomination. Wasn't hanging out with the master. But 100% was in the master. With strong personal faith. Matthew 17, verses 20 to 21, talks about faith, the grain of a mustard seed. We've heard it a billion times, but do we believe in growing it? We tend to look at it as, oh, if I could just find my mustard seed, it fell under the carpet someplace. <laughs> Got a whole jar of mustard seed sitting over there. Got a whole jar of mustard seed sitting over here. Got a whole jar of mustard seed sitting right there. You know what else? We even got sellers of oil if you old virgins want to get off your sleepy beds and go get yourself some. <laughs> the marketplace is open right now. Right now. The marketplace is open right now. There will come a day when the sound of the bride and the bridegroom will not be in the street anymore. But right now, market's open. It is daylight hours. We are still able to go buy and sell spiritual things. We are still able to go find the truth. Just look around you. Truth published every day. Somebody publishes a new book. Every day, a new prophet steps up. Every day, another apostle steps up and says, Well, I've been silent long enough. It's time for me to be on the scene. Every day, new teachers are showing up. Every day, music ministers are showing up. Every day. Do you realize what God is doing? He said, I'm not going to come until you cover the whole earth. And he just keeps making more music ministers and more worship leaders and more people who get a plugged in and more people who start realizing, yeah, I guess my songs should change from being happy, wappy songs to being something with depth. And more people preaching sermons that are going to have more strength to them because their personal faith is being altered by a God who believes in personal faith. And as that happens, the corporate faith increases. The more individuals who believe, the stronger the corporate belief is. A Corinthian church model, I've said it from the beginning, is the only right model. Every church should have the Corinthian model. Nine gifts operating, eight or nine offices according to the listings, functions and purposes, administrations, and the weak getting taken care of by the strong. Until they're not weak anymore. Ephesians 5.1 says, Be followers of God. You are followers of God. Fine. Follow God. Follow God wherever He may be found. 
If he's in a five-year-old, follow him. If he's in a 20-year-old, follow him. If he's in a body, follow it. Pay attention to it. Listen. And you won't ever hunger or thirst. Then go and look at yourself in the mirror. Talk to yourself. O oh soul, why art thou disquieted? Hope thou in God. Let's quote some verses here. Let's get me some anointing. Follow God who hides in you too, you know. God lives in you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.16 Follow me. That's corporate. As I follow Christ, that's personal. Do it the way I do it. That's what Paul's saying. Let me show you how it's done. I'll write three quarters of the New Testament for you. <laughs> I'll show you how it's done. Personal faith. I know my time's up. I've done a good job. I'm ready to go. Now, as for you guys, watch out. Wolves coming. Grievous wolves. Going to devour the flock. Going to change you. Watch out. Keep your personal faith alive. Keep it strong. James 5, 16 and 17 talks about the prayers of a righteous man availing much. Prayers of a righteous man avail much. One man. Doesn't say a bunch of men. The prayers of one man avail much. One can chase a thousand. Take the rest of the verse any way you want. Corporate anointing works. Individual anointing drives it. When individual anointing dries up, corporate anointing vanishes. Vanishes. And you're left with the shell without substance. You're left with the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The power thereof was in the individual all along. When the individual's faith dies, the church limps. When the individual faith is caught in a snowstorm blizzard and doesn't know which way to go, leadership starts getting weird cross anointings. When people are stuck in gossip and leading by gossip, weird anointings. Yeah. What I'm trying to say here is, be ye strong, be ye mighty, and be ye plugged in. Uh -huh. This rift that the devil's done, where... Individuals with power and anointing keep getting ripped out of churches that need it. Sent away, have to be put away, who knows. You know? And, and entities that are anointed with people coming in trying to tear them down, make sure the body doesn't function fully, point out every little mistake, make sure you decrease the faith of the populace so the individuals are scared to death to even try to pray. It's happening. Acts 2, 17 and 18. I'm going to read it out loud. Because I want it heard. On my servants, excuse me, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon a few choice ones who are in the correct denomination, yielded the right way, fully obedient, dressed in white, and ready for my coming. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. For a moment there, I went to a different book. You're absolutely right. Wrong book. That was the book of, of Murmur. And it came to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Right on. Right on. I am going to tell you in advance of things to come. That's what the Holy Ghost is for. I'm going to give you anointing to back up the words. So you can have signs and wonders falling. That's what the anointing is for. And when all of us are prophets, is that possible? Maybe not. Prophets is still a special place. But when all of us are prophetic, oh, the prophets are going to have a much easier time. Because <laughs> right now, they're kind of pulling a mule by the nose. Come on, come on, come on. That's what they hear. 
My servants, my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in signs in the earth. And I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, honest, I will, I will, I will. What's God's will? I will. Here's what I will. I will, all of you, fill up. Got places to go and things to do and people to save. Fill up. Matthew 7, 7 to 9. Let's bring it in here. Here's where it fits. Matthew 7, 7 to 9. I realize I'm going a little longer in the sermon, but I'm not going to cut this one short. Matthew 7, 7 to 9. Ask, it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened to you. How many times have I read that and never, never heard the word you? It's kind of like you blink the word you when you read it. Ask, and it'll be opened to you. I mean, ask, and it'll be given to you. You ask, and it'll be given to you, friend. Leadership? No, you. If you haven't got it yet, you haven't got it yet. Keep asking. If you haven't heard it yet, you haven't heard it yet. Keep listening. And if the door seems shut, and your prayer life seems shut, and something doesn't seem quite right, bang on the door. That's what the importunity woman's story was all about. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, bang, bang. I don't care if he's asleep. I don't care if it looks like God's on a journey far away. Ring the doorbell. He'll come a-running. He'll come a-running. Because this was a personal faith statement. It was not a corporate faith statement. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, he will give him a stone? Come on. Quit saying, if the Lord will. Say, the Lord will, if. How were so many New Testament healings achieved? Just going to read you a few verses. Just a few. Matthew 9.22 you already know the answer, but I'm going to read it anyway. Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith has made thee whole. Your faith has made you whole. You stepped up to the plate. Mark 10, 51. That's not right. Nope, it is if I was in Mark. 10, 51. Jesus answered, said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said to him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said to him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. Whereas we started this sermon where the group of the four guys got their friend healed, these guys pushed in so hard they got their own healing. This is the balance. Both are true. Both are mandatory. Both are needed. And those four guys who lifted him had to be strong enough and healthy to get him in there. If we're going to carry those who are worse off than us, we better be strong. If we're going to point our fingers at others and say, you're not anointed, we better be twice as anointed because we're going to have to carry them. Luke 17, 19. 17, 19. Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. <coughs> What's real interesting about that one is that's the story of the ten lepers, where one came back and said thanks. It leaves the implication that, that the other nine walked away, they were cleansed, but didn't get whole. Think about that. Read about it a little bit. How did Jesus survive the cross? I want to throw this one as a bonus. How did Jesus survive the cross? How did he do it? How did God... I don't understand... How did, how did Jesus survive the cross? We look at him and we marvel. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his house, to his own, and you shall leave me alone. Yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I am not alone, the Father is with me. John 16, 32. John 11, 14. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which I stand by, blah, 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 blah. I know that you hear me always. When you open your mouth, do you have that, that way down inside that says, I know God's listening? I know God, not only is he listening, but he's going to respond. Do you believe that he is and 
that he is a rewarder of them who diligently, diligently seek him. That's personal faith. That's 100% personal faith. The church corporate faith was built on individuals with powerful personal faith. Mm -hmm. And we would not exist today. And we would not have their books to read today if they hadn't gone to the woodshed, if they hadn't gone to the closet, if they hadn't gone to the mountaintop, if they hadn't gone out in the wilderness and put on airy coats and ate locusts and honey and did what they did, we would not have what we have today. Personal faith is what did that. The other thing that got Jesus all the way to the end was, not my will but thine be done. Luke 22, 42. And the last thing that got him there, maybe not the only thing, but one of the last things I'm going to quote for today, Luke 4, 8. Jesus answered and says to the devil, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. He did not say by every word of the priest, by every word of the church, by every word of your denomination, by every word of your creed, or even your own opinion. He said by every word that you can get from God. And when he said that at the beginning of his life, he lived it at the end of his life. Because when he came right down to the not my will but thine be done, and then it became, why hast thou forsaken me? He still didn't change course. Because he was very much like the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. We say unto thee, O devil, whether I die on this cross or I come down from this cross, <laughs> I'm not serving you. <laughs> whether God deliver me or not, and in this case, not. We have an anointing that teaches us, yet we need teachers, and yet we need to become teachers. Write down these three verses. 1 John 2.27, no man needs to teach you. Ephesians 4.11, we are supposed to be teachers. Hebrews 5.12, you need to become teachers. Personal faith saves and unites and body faith also saves. Write down these verses. Romans 10.9 Personal faith. Ephesians 4.13 Acts 1.14 Acts 4.24 and 31-33 to And I'm only going to come on the Acts 4 one. In the Acts 4 one, they all get together and they pray a long prayer. Lord, why are these guys doing this? And we need your help. <laughs> and in the end, the room gets shaken and things begin even more powerfully than they were on the day of Pentecost. We are Pentecostals. We have had the day of Pentecost. Have we had the day of Acts chapter 4 yet? I don't see no building shaking, do you? Increase your personal faith. Get together with people who have strong personal faith and then see if the room won't shake. Concluding facts. Number one, a chain is only as good as its weakest link. And as I discovered this winter, a fence is only as strong as its weakest beam. <laughs> and a church is only as strong as its least gifted member. So here's the solution personally press into the face of God personally chase after the presence of God and don't stop doesn't matter how tired you are it doesn't matter if it seems like God's a carrot right out here always a little far away it doesn't matter do not stop until your personal faith your personal faith exceeds those that are around you why did I say that? Then pray that their personal faith will increase. 
the purpose of God elevating some to a higher post position and purpose is for the upbuilding of the rest of the body to bring them up too. And if we do it right, we will leapfrog over each other. Mm-hmm. Just ascending to higher and higher states of yieldability. The mistake has been, because we've been stuck in this corporate idolization thing, when one of us finally gets some anointing and really gets to be somebody, we're ready for people to worship us. And then we leave the church that needed us, and then we don't do what was given us, and then we wonder what's happened to us. Yeah, I've seen it. It's real. My last verse to conclude the message is Romans one seventeen. Romans one seventeen. Thanks for your patience. For there is, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I want you to hear that now with the word personal in front of it. Because that's how you live. That's how I live. That's how we, as a church, singular or universal, will end up living. Other than that, we all go to sleep. I don't think we want that. Lord, thank you for this message. Strong and long, good and healthy. Ask your blessing upon our minds and our hearts as we go, Lord, that we might not forget any of the words therein, and certainly not forget the spirit therein. Amen.